Ernest Ernie Taylor Powell was born on the 3rd of August 1900 on a farm near Dana, Indiana. He quickly became bored of farm life and strived for adventure, joining the US Naval Reserve at the tail end of the First World War, but not seeing any significant service. In 1919, he enrolled at the Indiana University. Keen to take a degree in journalism, finding the school did not offer one at the time, he decided to major in economics, but made sure to take any and all journalism courses available to him. He joined a fraternity and started to work on the student's paper, the Indiana Daily Student, during his junior year becoming their city editor and news editor. It was while writing and editing for this publication, he started to become known for his simple, story-like reports, something that would make him world famous in the years to come. By the time that America joined the Second World War by declaring war on Germany and Japan on the 11th of December 1941, Ernie Pard had already established himself as a well-known travel journalist, writing human interest stories while travelling around America in the 30s with his wife Geraldine. His columns were published under the moniker The Hoosier Vegabond and his wife That Girl Who Rides With Me, his work being syndicated for the Scripps Howards newspaper chain. Volunteering to go to London in 1940, one full year before the American involvement in the war, he witnessed the bombing of London and reported on the developing war. His reports were vital in showing the American public the plight of the British people. A compilation of his reports were published in 1941, called Ernie Pard in England. You cannot help but be anguished at death and destruction, and sometimes you sink into a despair of abysmal hopelessness when you stand in the centre of a complete ravage, and yet it's war. And I can't blame Germany for fighting, nor England for fighting back. They're both in there punching, and may the best man win. And if England isn't the best man, may she win anyhow, damn it. After covering the home front in London, Ernie found himself in North Africa to cover the American forces stationed there after Operation Torch, embedding himself with the troops on the ground and it was there where he found his muse, or muses if you will, his love of the common GI, saying that I love the infantry because they are the underdogs. They are the mud, rain, frost and wind boys. They have no comforts, and they even learn to live without the necessities. And in the end, they are the guys that wars can't be won without. Endearing himself to the men around him and the readers back home, Instantly recognisable with his wry smile and iconic jeep hat and Mackinac coat, the man himself cut a wiry figure and was in his early 40s by the time America entered the war. He was prone to bouts of depression and got ill frequently, leading to spells behind the lines in rest camps and field hospitals. He often doubted his own work and would constantly fret over the smallest of details and wordings of his columns. In December 1943, Paul was in Italy recording on the bitter fighting around a place called San Pietro which turned into a long and bloody battle during a wet and muddy winter offensive. It was during this battle that Pyle wrote possibly his most influential and well-remembered pieces about Captain Wasco, a 25-year-old company commander of the 36th Infantry Division. A well-respected leader of men, one of the soldiers under his command told Pyle, After my own father, he came next. It was here he wrote The Death of Captain Wasco. This one is Captain Wasco one of them said quietly. Two men unlashed his body from the mule and lifted it off and laid it in the shadow beside the low stone wall. Other men took other bodies off. Finally there were five laying end to end in a long row alongside the road. You don't cover up dead men in the combat zone, they just lie there in the shadows until somebody else comes after them. The unburdened mules moved off to their olive orchard. The men in the road seemed reluctant to leave. They stood around and gradually one by one I could sense them moving closer to Captain Wascow's body. Not so much to look, I think, as to say something in finality to him and to themselves. I stood close by and I could hear one soldier come and look down. He said out loud, God damn it. That's all he said, and then he walked away. Another one came. He said, God damn it to hell anyway. He looked down for a few moments, and then he turned and left. Another man came. I think he was an officer. It was hard to tell officers from men in the half-light, for they were all bearded and grimy dirty. The man looked down into the dead captain's face, and then he spoke directly to him, as if he were alive. He said, I'm sorry, old man. Then a soldier came and stood beside the officer and bent over, and he spoke to the dead captain, not a whisper, but awfully tenderly, and he said, I sure am sorry, sir. 
It was for visceral and hard-hitting reporting like this that in 1944 Ernie would receive the Pulitzer Prize for correspondence for his work from 1943. By this time in the war, Pyle was at the peak of his fame, even having a motion picture put into the works called Ernie Pyle, The Story of G.I. Joe, starring Burgess Meredith as Pyle, later gaining fame as Mickey in the Rocky movies, and a young Robert Mitchum, who earned his only Oscar nomination for starring in the movie. Pyle was involved in the production helping cast himself. He said this of the film, They're still calling it the story of G.I. Joe. I never did like the title, but nobody could ever think of a better one, and I was too lazy to try. The film was released in June 1945, and received very positive reviews. General D.Y. Eisenhower calling it the best war movie he'd ever seen. Unfortunately, Pyle wouldn't be able to celebrate the success of the movie. After embedding himself within the invasion forces of the Normandy in 1944, and following the successful push towards and the eventual liberation of Paris in August, Ernie travelled back to the States for some well-earned R&R, and mentally and physically exhausted Pyle knew that he would be, as he put it, back warhorsing around the Pacific. With some reluctance and his personal life in tatters, Pyle decided to cover the Pacific theatre in January 1945, this time being embedded with the US Navy on the USS Cabot an independence-class aircraft carrier. It was during this time, Pyle had premonitions of his own death and wrote to friends saying he feared he may not survive the war. Pyle managed to get himself ashore during the Battle of Okinawa, the last major campaign of World War II, going ashore on the small island of Le Shima off Okinawa. He was attached to the 77th Infantry Division as they fought to take the island. On the 18th of April 1945, Ernie and Lieutenant Colonel Joseph B. Coolidge were in a jeep travelling to a new command position when a concealed Japanese machine gun opened fire on them. The men jumped from the vehicle and took cover. Coolidge described what happened next. A little later, Pyle and I raised up to look around. Another burst hit the road over our heads. I looked at Ernie and saw he'd been hit. A machine gun bullet had entered Pyle's left temple just underneath his helmet, killing him instantly. President Truman, who had only been in office days before Pyle's death, said this of the late journalist. No man in this war has so well told the story of the American fighting man as the American fighting men wanted it told. He deserves the gratitude of all of his countrymen. The death of Ernie Pyle was a shock to the men of the United States military, who he admired and championed so much in his work. The men of the 77th Infantry Division erected a memorial to him that still stands in the area he was killed. It reads... At this spot, the 77th Infantry Division lost a buddy, Ernie Pyle, 18th of April 1945.